The kidney is a fascinating and complex organ, and besides forming urine, it also plays an important role in endocrine function, regulation of plasma electrolytes and pH, as well as blood pressure and body water volume. In this series of lessons, we're going to answer the question, how do the kidneys form urine? Now the formation of urine begins as the plasma enters the kidneys through the renal artery, and a portion of the plasma containing water, electrolytes, solutes, metabolic waste products, and even drugs exits the kidney through the ureters. The remainder exits the renal veins. So what factors determine the composition of urine? Well, the formation of urine involves filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and these processes occur exclusively in the nephron. So let's use this simplified view of the nephron to explain these processes. Filtration is the first step in the formation of urine and it begins as plasma exits the afferent arterial and enters the glomerular capillaries. Once inside the glomerular capillaries, hydrostatic pressure promotes the movement of water, electrolytes, solutes, and waste products across the glomerular capillaries into the Bowman space of the glomerulus, at which point this fluid is referred to as the filtrate or ultrafiltrate. The plasma that is not filtered exits the glomerular capillaries via the efferent arterioles and enters the peritubular capillaries or the vasorecta. Now the ultrafiltrate formed within the Bowman space passes unobstructed into the lumen of the nephron where most of the water, electrolytes, and solutes are reabsorbed. In other words, they're transported across the tubule back into the peritubular capillaries or the vasorecta, which will have the net effect of lowering the concentration of that substance in the urine. Conversely, secretion involves the transport of primarily solutes from the peritubular capillaries back into the ultrafiltrate of the tubule. Let's describe these processes in greater detail. Since we'll cover filtration in greater detail in the next series, we'll limit our detailed discussion in this lesson to reabsorption and secretion. As we mentioned earlier, reabsorption involves the movement of water, solutes, and electrolytes from the ultrafiltrate across the tubule into the peritubular capillaries. And reabsorption occurs via two distinct pathways, transcellular, or across the cells, and paracellular, or between the cells. The transcellular pathways involve the movement across the apical and basolateral membranes, interstitial space, and finally, into the peritubular capillaries. Movement across the membrane involves transporters and channels located in both the apical and basolateral membranes. For example, 65 to 85 percent of sodium in the ultrafiltrate is reabsorbed along the proximal tubule via apical sodium-dependent co-transporters like the sodium glucose co-transporters and the sodium hydrogen exchanger. Now, the sodium gradient required for the reabsorption of sodium from the ultrafiltrate is established by the basolateral sodium-potassium ATPase. Also, 20 to 25 percent of the sodium in the ultrafiltrate is reabsorbed along the thick ascending limb via the apically located sodium-potassium 2-chloride co-transporter, or NKCC2. Again, the sodium gradient required for reabsorption of sodium from the ultrafiltrate along this segment is established by the basolateral sodium-potassium ATPase. And finally, about 1 to 7 percent of the sodium in the ultrafiltrate is reabsorbed along the cortical collecting duct via apical epithelial sodium channels, or ENAC. And again, the sodium gradient required for the reabsorption of sodium from the ultrafiltrate along this segment is also established by the basolateral sodium-potassium ATPase. Now relative to transcellular reabsorption, paracellular reabsorption plays a smaller role, but an important one. For example, paracellular reabsorption accounts for a large part of calcium reabsorption along the proximal tubule and thick ascending limb. Likewise, paracellular reabsorption dominates chloride reabsorption along the proximal tubule. As we mentioned earlier, secretion involves the movement of primarily solutes from the peritubular capillaries back into the ultrafiltrate of the tubule. Unlike reabsorption, which occurs via transcellular and paracellular pathways, secretion occurs via transcellular pathways only. Furthermore, the majority of secretion involves the transport of negatively charged anions from the peritubular capillaries into the proximal tubule. For example, the loop diuretic furosemide, which inhibits the NKCC2 co-transporter, is transported through the plasma bound to proteins. However, furosemide works by binding to the apical domain 
of the NKCC2 co-transporter. This means that it must be secreted into the ultrafiltrate in order to inhibit the NKCC2 co-transporter. The primary route for many organic anions, including endogenous metabolites, drugs, and antibiotics, involve a family of organic anion transporters, which include uniporters, co-transporters, and exchangers located in the basolateral and apical membrane of primarily the proximal tubule. In summary, the composition and volume of the urine depends on these three processes, filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. Now keep in mind, damage to the glomeruli, tubules, or peritubular capillaries will affect the kidney's ability to form urine. For example, acute kidney disease will increase the urinary concentration of substances that are reabsorbed, like sodium, while it will decrease the urinary concentration of substances that are secreted, 